CBME coming to you a little bit. Um, well, we'll say less production because you can't see behind me. I've got my Bloomberg badge on. Thank you to uh, Jason Zimmerman and the whole Bloomberg team running around here. Coming to you from Jumeirah Towers in Dubai during COP28. Uh, been uh, amazing so far. Really I incredible with the amount of people here, the dignitaries, everything going on for COP and sustainability. So this will be a little different podcast. Well, my glasses are, are a little crooked. I, I, I look, well, I always look funny, but maybe I look a little more funny. I don't know if I can fix them. What are we going to talk about? We're going to talk about COP, but we're going to talk about COP in the context of green and sustainability and the future and playing offense versus playing defense. A friend of mine, John Sutton, I travel the world with him, a, a amazing entrepreneur, a lot with food. Um, has said some really fascinating things. As we spend more time in Dubai, I took him out to the Royal Atlantis, the Atlantis Palm. And I'll talk to you in a minute. We've got a, a great event coming up this week. So this is uh, December 2nd, just for timing. In case you watch this at some point later, you'll have missed it. Um, we've rented the Lost Chambers of the Atlantis Underground Aquarium. It'll be an incredible event for SDG 14, which is Life Below Water. And we rented the aquarium underground at the Atlantis. And SDG 14, the Atlantis Chambers actually has 14 chambers. So quite a coincidence. I believe we partnered with Tonga and Public Foundation out of New York. And really will be an, an exciting event. What does that have to do with anything? I took John to a tour of the Atlantis first. The Atlantis Palm, beautiful. And he, he was blown away. He's walking around and looking and just going, this is amazing. And I said, well, I agree, but hold that thought until tomorrow. And I took him to the Royal Palm, brand new facility, doing amazing $2.5 billion on a brand new hotel. Now, $2.5 billion is a lot, obviously, and it's a new hotel. It's potentially in Dubai, but there's 50 or 60 hotels like the Atlantis. There's the whole Raffles a uh, hotel group with Sebastian and, and, and Accor, and you've got the Hyatts and Fairmonts and the the address. There's six address hotels connected just to Dubai Mall. The buildings are massive. We're all over the city. We went to a, an event with David Bird and Kevin Richards for the Bermuda. We were way outside of Dubai. And by way, I mean 10, 12, 15 miles, not hundreds, but there's cities everywhere. And John made some interesting observations. He said, wow, this city, unlike L.A., where we're from, especially L.A., but you, you could look at America or the big cities in general. Dubai and the UAE is playing offense. That's what I want to talk about, offense versus defense. There probably hasn't been, and again, these are comments I'm stealing from John. I give credit where credit's due, right? Three C's, credit, contacts, or compensation. This is the credit segment of of giving people credit for the great jobs. John said there probably hasn't been a new building built in Santa Monica in 50 years. Today is the UAE National Day. They're celebrating the 52nd year for the city of Dubai. 52 years. This entire city has been built in 52 years, and it continues to be built buildings, skyscrapers, everywhere you go, there's buildings and momentum and structures. And because of, of, of the timing of this, the architecture, the infrastructure, the, the, the roads, the logistics, this city, this region is playing offense. America, unfortunately, in cities like LA, they're playing defense. You can't spend $2.5 billion on a new hotel because you got to spend $10 billion on the homeless or the immigration. Now, this isn't political. This is reality. I'm not picking sides or casting aspersions. You're spending money in America on things that will return zero economic value. Now, is this all about economy and making money? No, but the economic value of the hotel, the number of people employed there was astounding. The number of people running around trying to help, impressive, incredible. The events right now, we're at, 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 at Bloomberg at the Green Forum. 
it's exciting. It's moving. It's momentum. The staff is excited that you're here. This region is playing offense and America and the big cities and a lot of the rest of the world is playing defense. How does that relate to climate? Um, I'm going to give you an interesting example. We have, have Greenway funding. We've got uh, a company set up to do bond funding for big projects. And and I've been asked, I won't mention names on this one because of the political sensitivity here. Uh, but I'm going to give you a couple stories that I just find interesting and relevant as they relate to sustainability. And I have three or four, so bear with me. Again, these are stories. I'm going to check my time and timing here. Everything's good. We're rolling. Um, number one. We were asked, we, I, I always say we, I, I, the, the pejorative nature saying, I, 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 I don't like that. So when I say we, a lot of times it's me, but me is we, because there's always people. But I, I was asked uh, something in Riyadh in Saudi, not too long ago, probably seven or eight months ago about something called the line. And the line is a great city. For those of you that don't know, the Riyadh and Saudi is opening up. They're changing the culture. They're changing the perception. And before you cast aspersions and say, oh, they have a problem here, you know, look in the mirror. America's, we've got our own problems. We've got our own set of issues. Every country does. So, you know, I'm a big proponent of there's no future in the past. What are we doing to move forward? How do we look ahead? Where does that go? So the line is this fascinating, quote, city being built. I believe, and I don't know if I'll get the numbers exactly right, but I know I'm right on some of them. It's, it's about 500 feet high. It's a vertical city. So imagine two, you know, a skyscraper, not super wide, but going straight up, connected in between with bridges and floating bridges and, and gardens and hanging gardens. It's 120 miles long. It goes through four ecological zones. It starts out in the middle, I think, of the desert. And it goes through the mountains and through another region. It ends up uh, at, the, at the Red Sea. And you'll be able to pull up boats and... and and, and, and yachts and commerce and shipping. But this thing's 120 miles long. What's it going to do? Well, there's no combustible engines. You'll be able to get from one end to the other in 20 minutes with internal transportation. Everything you need supposedly will be within a five-minute walk. So the convenience, the compactability, the comportment of all of this technology into something vertically contained. Yes, it's kind of hermetically sealed. It's in the the desert, but to control the air and the airflow and stuff. It looks beautiful. If you haven't seen it, go out and look. It's called the line. And they're estimated to spend a trillion dollars on it. And I was asked, oh, Stephen, what do you think? Do you think it'll work? And I said, well, I'm not sure, but I, I, I have an idea around it differently. I said, number one, this isn't about whether it works or not. The line is the greatest Petri dish Potentially, I won't say in the history of man. I mean, obviously, you know, moon and space travel. But in terms of sustainability, right, that's what we're talking about. Saudi government is willing to spend a trillion dollars on a vertical city, 120 miles long, with a lot of technologies and sustainability that have never, some of them have never been tested or tried before, much less put together in a total city. I said, guys, I don't know if it'll work. I hope it does. But this is the greatest Petri dish. You're an experiment willing to take a risk in building something that may or may not work. But if it does, this leads the future for other sustainable cities and other countries and governments to follow where they don't have to make mistakes. Right. Again, I could go back to America, not to cost cast aspersions. There was a, a company called Salerno or Salero. Years ago, I, I, again, the U.S. spent a lot of money on something solar, and it, it didn't work, and it failed, right? And there's been a lot of those. If you're a country like, like Saudi spending money to prove technology works, that's leading the world. That's an experiment worth taking. <clears throat> and when I talked about the footprint of that, again, to me, these numbers are fascinating when the line is full, if it's full of, of people, the population, I believe, will be the same population as London. So think about this for a minute. I was just in London. Thank you, Stephen Ball. Again, giving credit, we were at the Queen's Commonwealth Trust for the Queen of England, an amazing organization. I'll probably be reaching out to a lot of you for that. 
Uh, we were at St. James Palace with the Duke of Edinburgh, who was so gracious. Again, I'm digressing. I'm jumping all over. What's the point of that is London is huge. It's massive. People walking everywhere, buildings. The line will have the same number of people, but take up 5% of the land mass of London. Think about that for a minute. Same number of people, 5% of the landmass, 95% of the ecology, the environment, the mountains, the oceans, the deserts are untouched by the city of the line of man and civilization. Talk about something amazing, right? And, and, and what does that lead to? I'm often asked, oh, well, how can you be in Dubai? How can you be in Abu Dhabi? They do oil. Hey, we all do oil. Every one of you wearing clothes are made by oil. Your shoes are made by oil. Your glasses are made by oil. Your computer's made by oil. Oil is not the enemy. The past is not the enemy. Complacency is the enemy. And I'm asked often, I tell the guys in the region, quit complaining about oil. Quit playing defense. Quit apologizing. Right? I don't think this region should apologize for oil. We're not talking political. We're not talking cultural. Let's let's talk about oil and environmental. That's what we're here for. Stop apologizing for oil. Oil has made the world where it is. It's risen more people out of poverty. More people die from cold than heat. The only way to stay warm in the winter is oil and natural gas. Oil has provided for this world and this economy and this population and this civilization to achieve things unbelievable and unremarkable. Does that mean we have to be complacent? Absolutely not. This is about leading to the future, about changing dynamics, about how do you project not only a strength moving forward, but a mentality, a capability, a willingness to invest and do things as an experiment that could potentially change the world. Abu Dhabi, they're on a net 2050, I think, a 2050 race to zero. Dubai, the, Dubai's got a brand new program I'm hoping to be a part of, I have to work on, called Dubai 2033. What can they do in the next 10 years? What, what can they do in the next decade? And, and shake ten things on there. Very, very specific. If I ask you what are the 10 things America wants to accomplish in the next three years, five years, ten, nobody knows. Oh, Fix immigration. Yeah, we've been on that one for 45 years. Right? Very specific goals. How how can you change the world? How can you invest money? And do you have the government, the systems, the manpower, the infrastructure, the money, and the willingness to make those changes to see if they work? And that's what this region's doing. That's what I'm fascinated by. That's what I love. Not only about COP. COP's going to rotate around the world. It'll be somewhere in Europe, possibly next year. But this region as a whole has really been amazing. They're playing offense, not defense. And I'm going to give you another one. So number one was the line, which I think is fascinating, a trillion dollar experiment. Number two is quit apologizing for oil. Oil has put us where we are, but don't be complacent. Talk about what you're doing in the future. I'm going to give you one example. This is a project where we're helping through Green Wave, and I'm fascinated by it. Again, will it work? I don't know. We believe it will. Looks cool. Christopher, the scientist, has convinced a lot of people. Vincent, the CEO, is doing amazing. Peter Knez, formerly a BlackRock chairman. Like, so what does Geyser do? Well, Geyser is clean hydrogen. I know a lot of people talk about clean hydrogen. Clean hydrogen is basically taking water. Again, I'm not the scientist, so follow me. But it's pretty simple. I'm a good explainer, not a good operator. What does what does geyser do? It can take water, which is basically H2O, right? Hydrogen and oxygen and parts. Split the molecules apart. I think using sound frequency, which is a better coefficient for electricity to split. I'm not sure. Basically, create clean hydrogen and oxygen and bundle the oxygen together. And now that clean oxygen can be stored and sold back to hospitals and things like that. But Hydrogen's really the fuel of the future, potentially. How do you create hydrogen? Again, you break water. Where's water? Oh, in the ocean, there's a whole lot of seawater. 
So what has Geyser done? Geyser's partnered with Adnock. And again, I, I hope it, none of this is confidential. I believe it's all coming out. We won't discuss particulars. Let's, let's, let's not talk particulars. Let's talk macro. In the world, I believe the numbers are 5,900. Let's say over 5,000 existing oil rigs off the coast around the world. Countries around the world, every, almost any of you that have been along the coast, like in Santa Barbara, you can see them out along the coastline, right? These massive oil wells, not the deep sea ocean rigs that can be moved around, but these are oil rigs off the coast that have been, quote, decommissioned, meaning there's there's not enough oil in there to profitably drill. There may be some oil left, but not enough to make it profitable. So they're just sitting there, technically decommissioned, empty, vacant, degenerating, decomposing. Well, to pull those things down out of the ocean is not only expensive, it's estimated 20, 30, 40, 50 million dollars to break them down. And you probably have welders and you can't blow them up and have all this stuff. The, the impact on the environment, the ecology, the ocean would be horrible. It, you can't blow a rig up. There's no way to do that. And if you were to break it down piece by piece with blow torches, everything in the ocean. So there's not a lot of alternatives. However, Bill McDonough, again, the, the creator of the R3, right? Repurpose, reuse, remanufacture. And I like recycle. I like the fourth R. But how do you repurpose existing infrastructure? How do you remodel something that's already there and reutilize it for the greater good. That's what Geyser's doing with Adnock. Adnock's not sitting around saying, we want to sell oil forever. Adnock's saying, hey, what's the future? What can we do to move past oil? What can we do to play offense, to potentially get off oil, to reduce carbon, to be at net zero by 2050? Aha, uh -huh. in comes Geyser. Here's the theory. I hope it'll work. This will be amazing take over in a partnership the existing infrastructure of the oil platform repurpose it by putting the geyser technology on the platform it's and again they're expensive 20 30 million dollars to repurpose we're I, I hope we're helping them with a green bond a green bond or a blue bond to fund that development but now you've got an existing platform right an 80 hundred million dollar infrastructure that's just sitting there doing nothing repurposed with geyser technology to extract seawater. Pretty, I won't say it's an unlimited supply, but it's pretty easy to get seawater when you're out in the middle of the ocean. Split the molecules, store the oxygen, and the hydrogen is now shipped back through the pipelines that were going into the ports on shore. Instead of piping oil back to be refined, you're piping clean hydrogen back into the ports. Talk about a game changer. Now, are there a lot of hydrogen machines yet and cars? No, because there's not deployment of hydrogen to the gas pumps. That'll be coming. What about cruise ships? A cruise ship has to pull up to a port, sit there for hours or days. I don't know, filling up with diesel. The diesel's been pumped in and refined. If that clean hydrogen from the platform through the existing pipes onto the port is sitting there, that cruise ship all of a sudden, now the ships will have to convert their machinery from diesel to hydrogen, and they don't have a reason to because they can't get hydrogen, right? It's got to start chicken or the egg. Well, the chicken over here, geyser, is about to lay the egg. The egg's going to be coming into the port. Now you can crack the egg and people can eat it. I don't know where I came up with that analogy. Sorry about that. But all of a sudden, you'd have industrial machinery, right? Forklifts, trucks, these things that are running the ports will have immediate instant access to clean, potentially unlimited hydrogen that could move a country a, an emirate actually like abu dhabi off of oil it could move a reason like dubai off of oil what else could it do think about another country right think about the african nations think about any nation that potentially has an oil platform off the coast if geyser technology works, you repurpose, reutilize, remanufacture an existing platform, create clean hydrogen, ship that hydrogen back onto the port, that country could potentially become energy independent off of oil, energy independent off of liquid natural gas. We're talking about creating clean energy and making countries 
not only net zero and carbon zero, all that stuff's great. All that stuff will help the environment. You're talking about moving a country into energy independence. That's amazing. That's a game changer. That's playing offense. Is that an oil company? Yeah, it's Adnoc, one of the largest in the world. Adnoc for Abu Dhabi and UAE is like our, in, in the U.S., Shell or BP or Exxon. These guys aren't sitting around trying to sell the world oil forever. Oil's, oil's old news. The, the world still runs on oil, but it doesn't have to. How do you play offense, not defense? How do you change the perspective and the parameter of what you're doing? I'm going to give you another one. Again, this is offense on defense. These are all things in process and in motion. We're excited about. We're being brought into two opportunities. They're both kind of the same. One is potentially uh, called One Amazon, I think, or Amazon One. No, One Amazon. It's the Amazon Rainforest. Uh, again, these are particulars. They're not fully baked. By the time you watch this, they may or may not be. Basically, it's taking part of the Amazon Rainforest and trying to uh, save it. People want to save the rainforest. Uh, another one over here is sustainable mining. What do they both have in common? Well, at a top level, no pun intended, their land. Right? So let's talk about the mining one first. The mining one's kind of cool. It's it's with the country of Indonesia. It's uh, sustainable mining. You say, how do you do sustainable mining? Well, there's ways to redo mining facilities. There's ways to redo mining equipment. There's ways to build the smelting and the refinery machines on a continent as opposed to exporting minerals off continent and refining them in another country that may not be as environmentally conscious or or conservative. So Indonesia and Joko have done an amazing job changing some laws, making the um, a mineral stay on continent, doing the refining. So there's a lot of infrastructure that has to be changed and built. One of the particular things that, that we're working on isn't gold mine. It's Again, I please don't ever hold me to the exact numbers. Conceptually, you get it if you want to drill down on numbers I give you. But I think it's 30,000 hectares. I don't know what a hectare is. It's something like an acre, but it's a lot. About 2,000 hectares underneath have been mined for the gold. And so any of you guys that can conceptually imagine a gold mine, it's not above ground, it's underground. Well, what's above ground? Land. Well, is the land an asset? The land is, is an asset in terms of the land itself has a value. The real value is the gold extraction. What do you do on top? We're investigating a couple of things. Number one, this new fascinating thing we love called industrial hemp. Hemp is a plant. Very, It can be made into textiles and clothing and building materials. It's a plant that grows very fast. It's not THC. It's not marijuana. Hemp is an industrial version of a plant. This plant can be harvested four to six times a year. Kind of like hay. I was explaining it to somebody here in Dubai yesterday. They're like, I don't get it. I said, think of hay, right? Hay is just straw. Hay grows. You cut it down. You put it in bales. And you could compress that hay. It's not the best because the tensile strength isn't very good. But you could compress it and try to make things. Industrial hemp can be compressed. What's one of the best things to compress it into? How about particle board for buildings? Instead of plywood that you make houses out of, well, the plywood and the ply board, for the most part, is made from trees and particles and sawdust. If you could grow industrial hemp, harvest it four to six times to what's called a biomass, create the biomass into an output product like particle board, particle board into low-income housing, you now have a sustainative, sustain, sustainable, regenerative repurpose. We're repurposing the land, reutilizing the land on top, to create an output. Not only does that help create a biomass and a product that can be sold and generate revenue and help the, the, the housing side and reduce consumption of trees, the hemp gives you carbon credits offsets. It also puts nitrates back in the soil. So you've got the positive aspect of the carbon credits and the positive aspect of not reducing tree reduction because you produce particle output for boards to make houses. Talk about offense. The other side we're looking at is, again, uh, we're learning that apparently coconuts can be turned into biomass, the coconut husk. And one of those biomass that's been created, new technology is graphene. And graphene can be made into batteries. So we're investigating, can we grow coconut trees on top of the, the, the mine, have a plant there that creates graphene, whether they're somewhere else short, now you're creating graphene as an output into batteries 
to replace electric vehicle batteries that are made with lithium dug out of the earth in foreign countries where it's not the best uh, economic environment. It's not the best ecological environment. It's not the best employment environment. Coconut husk to a biomass to graphene to a battery. Let's go back to the Amazon. Why is that important? What we're going to investigate is rather than trying to plant new trees to save the Amazon and raise money to say, oh, we're buying this land so you don't cut these trees down. Can we work with farmers who've already decimated the land and say, rather than planting trees that, that'll take 10 or 15 years, can we plant something else that's more environmental and has a better output? Can you do industrial hemp? You still get the carbon credits. You still save the rainforest. But now you've got a farm that's got a regenerative output, produces income. The output of biomass is into housing products. And now you're not cutting down trees. You're not clearing land for, for, for trees and farming and things like that. How do, you, how do you think differently and play offense? Where does that lead also? Well, I, I'm not going to call us versions here. The Great Green Wall of Africa, we love these guys. Uh, Sheikh Mohammed MBS in Saudi's got the Green Initiative, the, the SGI Saudi Green Initiative. They're talking about planting trees, 50 billion trees. I, I understand why. The initiative of planting trees, the Great Green Wall of Africa is a little different. They're trying to plant trees to stop the, the, the desert from encroaching out um, on, onto more land. So that there's a little different purpose there. But the concept of, quote, planting trees is to help the environment. Okay, do you want to plant 50 billion trees, which you could do, and it'll take a long time to grow and help the environment? Or do we look past that and play offense with new alternatives, industrial hemp, coconut husk to graphene? I'm sure we're going to find others. That's the goal of, of GreenWave is to find these amazing technologies, help projects get funded. We, GreenWave funding does green bonds and blue bonds for governments and big projects. So if you're doing a smart city as an example, you have a $4 billion smart city that's being done in five phases and it's building hotels and mangroves and you've got land that's going to be developed over time. An Arizona project we're helping has 1,200 acres. It's not all going to be developed at once. How do you make land an asset? How do you make it environmental? How do you get it to produce revenue? How do you play offense, not defense? That's to me what environmental activism is about it's not about attacking oil it's not about looking to the past it's about saying what can we do to build technologies and environments and companies and leaders of the future that's what i see happening here at cop so again i'm watching people come in i i got here early to do the podcast bloomberg green is starting today uh monday tuesday COP28 is going out at Expo. Amazing time. So all of you, thank you for watching. Thank you for staying tuned. Keep me coming to you. I will be back with the next podcast soon. Thank you again.